Yeah, yeah. I was just reviewing him on the Trinity, both in RD and as well as in this volume. And it's tremendous to see the ways in which he develops a real orthodox uh, theology and a doctrine of the one and the many, based on not only the ecumenical tradition, but also the Reformed uh, creeds and confessional tradition as well, and doing so in a way that that establishes um, just a, a, a rock-solid foundation for moving forward with the challenges of modern theology. I think it also, I mean, this would have to be written and, and developed, but in my opinion, in my estimation, having spent a lot of time with Van Til, in, in, in substance, it, it vindicates Van Til's Trinitarian theology. Um, that's a contested statement. People are not going to like me saying that, but I mean, like I said, it'd have to be proven, you know, over the course of, of some writing. I try to do that in my Rahner book a little bit, but that, that's partly why I'm as interested because I've been reading and reviewing Rahner with the with the Great Thinker's book out and, and then going back to Bovink. And he's even uh, so sharp on really contemporary issues and, and very uh, clear in terms of um, not only the essence, but he's explicit in saying even the persons of the Godhead are immutable for, exi- for existence. So you cannot divide the persons from the essence in one way or the other, particularly in relation to creation, but in any consideration. The persons subsist in the essence, and the essence is nothing without the persons mutually subsisting within it, you know, perichoretically. So um, Bavink, yeah, maybe is 100 years old now in terms of, you know, uh, how much time has passed since since uh, he... he uh, I think it was uh, 1954, I think, was the 100th anniversary of his birth, correct? And now we're, we're right about the 100-year anniversary of his death, and that we're close to it. Nevertheless, he's right on point. And, and uh, reading him, you don't, I don't feel that it's like, oh, well, he's dealing with these issues of the past that don't, don't affect us today. He's right on the money dealing with things that we're struggling with within the Reformed Church even now. I think that's an excellent point. Um, it occurs to me that um, one of the one of the great blessings of this book is it's I would summarize it as concrete, organic, rich development of God's self-revelation. Mm. And it's a book that hangs together, centering on what the title indicates, the wonderful works of God. And the very first place that it, Charles can correct me, but the very first place that I see him identifying the works of God as something praiseworthy and that sets forth the majesty and glory of the triune God is right at the beginning of his chapter on the Trinity. And then he begins to weave a uh, mention of the works of God at three other places. And if it would be useful, uh, would you mind if I just read a couple oh, of sections please. where he yeah. where he talks about the wonderful works? Okay, the first the first instance where I see it is uh, in his section on the Trinity, and he says this. He says what the Christian goes on to confess about that God is not summarized by him in a number of abstract terms, but is described rather as a series of deeds done by God in the past and the present and to be done in the future. It is the deeds, the miracles of God, which constitute the confession of the Christian. What the Christian confesses in his creed is a long, a broad, and a high history. It is a history which comprises the whole world in its length and breadth, in its beginning process and end, in its origin, development, and destination, from the point of creation to the fulfillment of the ages. The confession of the church is a declaration of the mighty deeds of God. So right away, Bavink is distinguishing the absolute triune personal God from everything created. And yet in that distinction, he says there is an implied relation in which creation, which manifests the glory, wisdom, and majesty and power of God, reflects the unity and diversity of the Trinity. And then God further discloses his glory in the deeds and works that he displays and the words that he gives throughout human history. And so the next place where we see the wonderful works of God mentioned is at the beginning of his chapter on creation and providence. He says this, having discussed the doctrine of God and the Trinity, he then moves in earnest, and this is what the book is really about, what are the deeds that this triune God has done? He says on page 144, we do not learn to know and to glorify God in independence from his work but rather in and through his works in nature and in grace. 
So God reveals his triunity and the wonder of his works. Those works begin in earnest in creation and providence. And then later, okay, this is going to be on page 373, in a discussion of the gift of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. So he's got mention of the works of God when he speaks of God, the Trinity, then creation, and now at Pentecost at the recreation. And he says on page 373, and this is where the title of the book comes from, from Acts 2.11. He says, the purpose of the miracle, that is, um, the disciples speaking uh, of the mighty works of God in, in other tongues at Pentecost, the purpose of this miracle was not, therefore, to equip the disciples with the knowledge of strange languages, but rather in an unusual way to leave a powerful impression of the great event that had now taken place. And how could this be done better than by having the small, newly established world church proclaim in many tongues the mighty deeds of God? At the creation, the morning stars sang together, and all the children of God rejoiced. At the birth of Christ, the multitude of heavenly hosts raised the jubilee of God's goodwill. On the birthday of the church, that church itself sings the wonderful works of God in myriad tones. And then the fourth and final place where Bobbing mentions the wonderful works of God is on the last page of the book, when he's talking about the inhabitants of the new Jerusalem, declaring in one voice uh, the glory and might of God. And he says this, For all the inhabitants of the new Jerusalem will behold God's face and will bear his name upon their foreheads. And all together they will raise the song of Moses before the throne and the song of the Lamb, and each in his own way will proclaim the great works of God. Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Who would not fear thee and glorify thy name? So Bavink is just amazing in the way that he can set forth the richness of the glory of the triune God in creation and providence, in the recreative, redemptive work of Christ, and in the consummation of the kingdom on the last day. This is theology at its best, as it hangs together, and that is, as it is so thoroughly God-centered. And it just, mm -hmm. reading this book lifts you up into the portals of heaven, almost, uh, because it's so scripturally, um, so scripturally rich and, and biblically grounded.